All right, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Rob Fisher, and I'm a member of the faculty here at the Mandel School. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our uh, second in our three-part series on social investment strategies. Uh, and I invite you to uh, put a note in your calendar for our third in the series, which is next month on April 19th, same space, uh, focused on the role of technology in the nonprofit sector and where we are with that and what, what lies ahead. Uh, also, one other bit of housekeeping. You have an evaluation form, hopefully, that you picked up. If you didn't, you can pick one up at the table if you would like to give us some feedback on this session and maybe ideas for uh, where, we, where we go next year with this series. Um, our loose theme for this year's series is looking back, looking forward. And last month, we had uh, a focus on uh, the difference between charity and philanthropy as a kind of taking stock of where the sector has been. And this, this month, um, we're really delighted to have kind of a, uh, something that's a retrospective to current look at a, one of our largest uh, players in our, in our region and in many regions around the country, the United Way uh, affiliate here in Cleveland, uh, to look at how an really a, a legacy organization uh, and arguably the, the first in, in the country. I know Denver makes claims uh, that we dispute, uh, but certainly ours was the first community chest in the, in, in the world. Uh, to look at that organization over its hundred years and, and where it is and how it has reinvented itself uh, in that space. Uh, this, this series has, we're now in our third year and looking to the future, and I wanna thank uh, uh, Gail and Elliot Schlang uh, and their fund who has gave an inspiration to this series, and Gail is here with us. Thank you for coming, Gail. Thank you again for your inspiration and support for this work. Uh, now to introduce our speaker, I'm really pleased to introduce to you Dan Mansour, and if you came to our series uh, last year, you, you might recall Dan gave a a wonderful uh, presentation uh, on the science of giving, uh, brain, uh, with a lot of focus on brain science. Uh, if you don't know Dan, he's the first thing I always talk about is that he's an adjunct faculty member here at the school and teaches our philanthropic fundraising course in the m and program. In his hobby, he's the chief philanthropy officer at the United Way of Greater Cleveland. Uh, he's served as a consultant and philanthropy advisor for, I don't know if you quote the years, but I'll say 30 years doing this kind of work. Uh, he has, uh, he's gonna talk a lot about uh, what's been going on with United Way and certainly his role there in uh, repositioning, repositioning this now 103 year old organization. Uh, Dan started his career at Cornell where he did an, a BS and an MBA uh, he's worked at Brandeis Universities. He founded Good Works Group, a nonprofit consultancy and philanthropy advisory firm uh, that has worked nationally and internationally. Uh, he was also one of the guiding forces in the creation of Community Foundation in Ithaca, New York, uh, which now has assets over 15 million. Uh, and he's from Madison, Wisconsin. He's a Clevelander now. Uh, He's a wonderful guy, and I'm really pleased to welcome him and introduce him to you. Please welcome Dan. <clears throat> it sounds like I got enough on my resume. I should stop doing these presentations. So. Um, well, thanks for being here. Um, you know, last year I got a chance to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, which is really the behaviors that we encounter as we go about our fundraising. And I guess it was a little bit of an academic talk, though it's not my own research, it's just what I've collected from other faculties. Um, 
as I prepared for today, this was really kind of strange for me because I'm basically explaining what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I will confess we're not done. So I feel like I'm reporting to you halfway through the race. Um, and I can tell about the progress, some of the concerns, et cetera. I'd love this to be interactive. Um, please hold on to your questions or ask them as appropriate. Um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. I may end up skipping a few slides just to, uh, to keep uh, aware of the time, but um, I hope you enjoy it. This is an inside look. We talk about the theory behind fundraising. We talk about the theory behind management. Um, I have to say this is probably the most difficult job I've ever had in my life, which I guess you always want to have on your next job, um, partly because we're changing something that's been around for a long time. Um, you know, I came across this quote, U.S. economy is in the midst of a wrenching technological transformation that's fundamentally changing the way we sleep, work, eat, shop, love, read, and interact. This was the Atlantic. Actually, I think we could have found this quote probably in the late 1800s. Um, it seems that every generation surprises us with this. I've added that we need to also change how we give. Um, technology really hasn't hit this industry as strongly as it has others. I've used the quote, using today's technology, it's easier to buy a book about a hurricane than it is to actually help its victims. And for me, that's a crisis in our industry. Um, I came across this quote, innovation be distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And I wanna point out there's nothing wrong with being a follower. If I could figure out what's happening on E-Trade or Uber and apply it to the nonprofit sector, in a sense I'm a follower. Maybe we're a leader if we're applying it to a new industry. But the idea is that we're making progress and moving forward and it's something that every organization needs to be doing. So in order to do that, we have to be creative. We have to look at something everybody's looked at before and say, can we do this differently? And I'm gonna bring you along, and the only way to do that is to do an exercise. So this is our warm up that I might save for the end of the presentation. So to get you in a creative mood, many of you have seen this before, but I guarantee you haven't seen this in the same way. The question is posed, how many straight lines does it take to connect all these dots without lifting your pen or pencil off the paper? And just to keep this moving along, a lot of people start down at the top and go down to the corner, over to the side, then they go back up and come up with the answer five. Now there are a few of you who have seen this and go, well, we know that the right answer is actually four. Anyone familiar with this exercise? Okay, why? Because we, this is how we normally approach it and we realize, well, that doesn't do it, there's still one left. Well, we put an imaginary box around this which is, con it's contained by the outside dots. Nobody's put that box, this is an infinite piece of paper. If we go outside of the box, as in think outside the box, we come up with an answer of four, which is one less than we thought of before. So one lesson is think creatively. Lesson two is look for the second right answer. The second right answer in this case is only three lines if we look very carefully at the concept and imagine railroad tracks for a minute uh, that meet at the horizon if we go far enough. And you guys who know me know that I'm not done yet because if we decide for a minute that these are the same nine dots, I've got a smile in the back row who knows that the answer is in fact only one straight line if you've got a very <laughs> thick pencil. And in fact, if you position it slightly differently, we can actually do it with one line and a very thin pencil as well. Again, it just depends how we position our exercise. So I've given you two lessons, one be creative and two look for the second right answer. And then the third is don't make up rules that don't exist. I didn't say that you couldn't rearrange the lines. So why do I do this? Because in order to look at an organization, especially one that's been in business for 100 years in Cleveland and trying to do things differently, you have to be willing to break some barriers. And the creative process doesn't mean you have to actually implement, but you need a few ideas on the table before you figure out what's the best way to go. So let me give a brief history of United Way. 
if you do Google it, it'll say that it was started a rabbi, a nun, and I think a priest walk into a bar in Denver, Colorado. And while it sounds like a joke, it actually had happened. They thought there must be a better way in which we can fundraise in our community. And the money was in the corporations and the companies. And they thought they would collectively go on behalf of human service agencies, keeping in mind that those were the only kinds of organizations seeking funds at that time. If I was at the last presentation, this was really about charity. It was about helping people in need. It really wasn't about philanthropy, about investments in our future. Cleveland's uh, claim to fame is really the idea of community allocations. It wasn't just going in collectively and asking on behalf of organizations, but it was asking for unrestricted funds in which a volunteer-based community committee would help allocate to the most helpful and most useful areas in the community. And in 1930, 13, a very large spread in the New York Times gave credit to Cleveland as one of the most innovative, if not the most innovative city in the world when it comes to philanthropy with the creation of the community chest. Keeping in mind a year later, the first community foundation in the world was started here with the Cleveland Foundation. Where we're taking this, we believe in the future, is what I might call a philanthropic investment from the fundraising standpoint. And then I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but we are an annual fund. We're raising money to feed the hungry, to shelter the, uh, the homeless, um, to get medicine for those in need. Maybe our role might be more broad. Can we ask for philanthropic investments that actually might lead people to help come up with solutions? So one of the questions that we posed is, are we successful due to our method? And our method is to walk into 1,100 corporations. They ask on our behalf to make a contribution through payroll deduction, which was one of the great innovations in fundraising in United Way, and then trust us that we would spend that money wisely. Now, if you find the right Jeopardy episode under logos and they just have symbols, you'll see the United Way logo and the person got it right. People know us, they actually trust us, but they don't know what it, what it is that we do. I sometimes describe fundraising or giving to United Way as going to Nordstrom and buying a really great coat taking it home, putting it in your closet and feeling really good that somewhere in the world you've employed a coat maker. No, we want people to buy that coat, wrap it around and feel the warmth. And that's what we want out of the satisfaction of giving to United Way, which believe it or not is a fairly significant change in how we approach. And that's by sharing our message, what it is that we do with the money, how we make a difference in the community. We have an operation called 211. We take almost 1,000 phone calls every single day. And those phone calls save people time. They save people money, and occasionally they save people's lives. Most people don't know that if they know of 211, that's great, and if they, but they often don't know that it's actually a service of United Way, and it's what part of the funding goes to. So I'm going to take a step back and go through the exercise that I went through. Augie Napoli hired me to come in as for three months to do an assessment to lay out some strategic plans as a consultant. Um, he then said he wouldn't pay me my last invoice unless I stayed on, which is why I'm still working there. But I started by looking at the trends, some I was familiar with, but some I really had to dig into. So the first was looking at United Way. Over two 10-year periods, we saw a decline of 7% in giving. And if we break apart the most recent 10 years into two five-year segments, the decline was less, but it was still a 2% decline. Well, that compares to increased giving and in this country. So the country is giving more and more money, but United Way is not. That means we've got a problem that we have to attack and find out why. The red line is actually 2016 data. 2017 hasn't been released, but my guess is it's going to be an all-time record, nearing almost $400 billion, of which anywhere from 80 to 85, maybe even 90% if we include family foundations and donor advised funds are from individuals. Almost a billion dollars a day is being given away. So the question is for almost every nonprofit, are they giving it to us or are they giving it to someone else? But we don't have to convince people to give people care. So I also wanted to understand where people were giving money to. So on the, uh, the top on the left is religion. When I started in this profession, 51% um, of giving was to religion. Now it's down to 33, partly out of a condition that less people are attending formal or affiliating themselves with churches and synagogues. But human services has crept up year after year, uh, now 13, 14, 15%, depending what you're looking at. It turns out that more people give to human services to anything else. They just don't give most of their money 
money to it. Why? It's again, it's charity. Our fathers and mothers taught us to help those in need. Our religion has taught us to help those in need, which we do. We just don't make major investments, philanthropic investments, in the same way that we build buildings like this or endow scholarship funds. So I also wanted to get a sense of what the philanthropy picture looked like in Northeast Ohio. And if we take Boston University's you know, uh, Center on Philanthropy and the studies they've done, approximately two billion is given away each year from Northeast Ohio residents. And of that, if we look at the 13, 14% going to human services, it's almost 300 million. And United Way last year brought in about $42 million. Some of it government funding and contracts, but about 35 to 37, 000, 37 million of that through philanthropic gifts. So it's a small part. But again, it told me what the opportunity was if we could in fact channel more of that philanthropic giving through United Way. So let's talk about the other part of the landscape, technology. Now, this is a few years old now, but you can see where the change has been. Now, I ask each of you, you know, how often are you on your phones to gain information, to handle transactions? How often are you on your phones when you're making charitable contributions or reading about the charities you care about? My guess is not as much as it should be. Millennials, including my daughters and maybe me, 87% say they never let their phone away from their sight. Well, if that in fact is the case, then are we represented as a nonprofit institution? Are we in the, uh, in the, uh, the aim of our, our prospects using today's technology? And finally, just distractions. As good as our message is, it's easy to get a message out, it's hard to get noticed. We check our phones on average 45 times a day when we're doing it, 85% of the time on, our mobile, on a mobile app. Email, we think we've got a really well-crafted email we want everyone to read. Chances are they won't even read it or open it, and if they do, it's not gonna get more than a few seconds of attention. And the most important two for United Way are the bottom questions. When United Way was sta started, people passed away at their desk. I mean, they lived and worked at their corporation throughout their lives. The average tenure is much less. It's 4.6 years is the average tenure for an employee of a company. And finally, if you, we, we could always find people at their companies. We can't find them there now because they're moving, uh, moving around. This shows the average number of moves based, uh, that you have left in your life based on your age. And while I'm not 30, let's assume I feel 30, um, it still means that um, I'm expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of four moves in my life. And if we're counting on connections being only with the workplace, and not only are people leaving the workplace, but they're moving to new addresses, we're gonna lose our donors in a very quick, a short period of time if we don't have their uh, cell phone information, we don't have their emails. I'm gonna to touch on one slide on the science of giving is we have to understand the behavior of the donors. And this was important to me in realizing how United Way was fundraising. People are altruistic. Every study shows that. We hold the door open for other people. We sometimes jump on railroad tracks to save people's lives. We're happiest in our giving when these three things happen. One, we feel we have control. We're making the decision to the organization or the cause we care about. Two, by doing so, we feel a connection. You see that often in 24-hour giving or in a Velasano where we don't know everyone else but we feel part of a community that's giving. And finally, we feel happiest in our giving when we understand that we're making an impact. In many ways, this is the anti-United way. My boss is telling me I have to give. I don't have any idea where the money is going and I, yes, it's my fellow workers are joining me but I don't feel this collective effort and I don't hear from the organization uh, until next year when they ask me for another gift. I described the last as going on a really good date and coming around a year later and saying, we had a good time, do you want to do it again? That is not how we should be fundraising. So this comes into the total donor experience. So at United Way, we're starting to answer the question, what is the donor experience? Not the employee experience, but the donor experience. They happen to be employees. And these are all ways in which we do that. So what's the approach? Well, on the left side are a lot of terms of the, the sort of the state of the historical United Way campaign. Low donor loyalty, I'll show you some statistics because data is an important part of our analysis. We don't have home information. 
We're delayed in obtaining the status of the donations. Why? Because a campaign runs in September. We don't find out till January because it's through payroll deduction. And by then, we've already lost sort of the great attitude and the opportunity to thank people for their gift, tell them what their gift does. I mean, imagine you invited somebody to dinner in September, and in January, you found out whether they liked the meal or not. I mean, that's kind of what United Way's operation has been like. And then it was a one ask. I mean, how many of you only get one ask from your alma mater or from a charity? If you don't respond, you get multiple. But because of the workplace campaign, we felt we couldn't interrupt the workplace and we couldn't reach our donors except for that hope that they would, the message got through in September or October or whenever the workplace campaign um, happened. So our new aspirations are sort of the opposite of that. And we'll come back to that, these in a minute. I'll make these slides available, by the way. So, you know, I had 40 keys to success and I've tried to narrow it down to four. It's really hard to do. But one has to be the message. I mean, that gets our attention. We give to a variety of agencies, a variety of causes. We give to the ones that strike us as doing good, that appeal to us, that um, we want to share with other people. Eliminate the barriers of giving. There's a famous quote that we don't have to change people's motivation. They want to help, but we make it really hard for people to give. It takes me five sites and I think 162 keystrokes and several tab downs and drop down menus to make a gift to Case Western Reserve using their website. It takes me about two clicks to buy a book about Case Western Reserve on my Amazon account. Let's use the intelligence and business data that we have out there. We call it big data. It's only big data if you can do big things with it, and that's what we've done this year, and I'll show. We've hired a group called Pan Data, Case Western Reserve graduate. I highly recommend, if not just hearing them speak, but engaging them if you ever want to really understand where to go and where to take your uh, operations. And finally, more effective solicitor um, engagement. You know, We hand materials to the companies. Some are more active than others. So my recommendation as a consultant was to really get cute with the RE and focus on these three things. One is rebranding. What is our message? What, is, uh, what are we trying to communicate to our community? How do we let them know what it, United Way is? Refocus is really about the fundraising. The workplace campaign to this day still dominates our fundraising, but what were the other opportunities out there? And finally, retooling. How do we use technology and data to make a difference? And this was really the focus of our efforts in designing our approach and our strategy. And really quickly, beyond the strategy, we had to look at people. Nothing happens without the people. And in the first year, I'm really proud to say that I think we've got a fabulous group doing resource development at United Way. They're incredibly bright. They're motivated. They're fun to work with. They work well with us, play well with others, I believe, is the kindergarten expression. Um, but it's not just good enough to have you know, the right people in place. It's really how you work with them. And the top one there is really the organizational chart. We had 13 people doing doing workplace campaign. We now have seven people doing workplace campaign. We're raising almost the same amount of money, but we took those resources and those people and put them to other tasks, which I'll describe in a few minutes. So this is all, this is all we had to worry about. <laughs> Um, essentially, it was everything going on, some of which existed before I came on board and some of it didn't. The things that we weren't spending a lot of time were, were technology, data, and the donor platform. Very little on stewardship. Um, if you go to the far right side, we weren't doing much in the area of research, though we had a researcher, a very, very capable one. But we weren't taking that data and really applying it because research really helps with principal gifts, going to your major donors and asking them for support. And we really didn't have a robust uh, major gift program. And we did very, very little in breaking apart the workplace campaign. Simple example, our workplace campaign this year is roughly where it was last year. But what we're seeing is that the corporate gifts have gone down considerably but employee gifts are staying roughly the same. It's important to know that if you're trying to figure out a strategy. Up to now, we were just looking at workplace as a big umbrella without really understanding the dynamics of that. So I'm putting this, and this may be redundant. Uh, believe me, I got rid of 100 slides, so there are only about 70 left here. But what is the organizational structure? Who do you want in that? And finally, making sure that staff development is something you take into consideration on an ongoing basis, whether it's driven by the individuals themselves, by the department, um, by the supervisors, or by the organization as a whole. 
So, boldly, um, this was the title of a report we put together um, last summer. We engaged Pan Data for a very limited basis just to tear apart our data, and I want to share with you what they discovered. And we have very, very accurate information. In fact, our, our quality of our data for 25 years worth of information is incredibly high. Our only weakness is completeness, prim primarily in the area of home information, emails, and phone data. But just to give you an idea, I mean, and Rob mentioned this, um, we are the largest donor base of any organization in Northeast Ohio. Almost 500,000 people have made a gift to United Way in the last 25 years. What's interesting is 141,000 in the last five years, and last year in the neighborhood of 60,000 have given a gift. These bottom ones just show the number of that 141 who have given five years, four out of the five years, or just one out of the last five years. You can see the remarkable opportunity to go to people who've already bought your product and get them to do it again. If nothing else, to get them to sign up to commit to giving the same amount every year and just get them to do it every year. So the action they have to take to be a donor is to take no action. The accuracy of the information, we had home addresses. I don't really think we have 356 people working, living at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Center. So we had to do some cleanup of that data as well. So I apologize for the reverse order of this graph here. I would get a B minus if I was actually in a class, but um, it was presented this way. But we wanted to know the total number of distinct donors. And what was really interesting is some of our best years in total dollars were actually um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So we were getting larger gifts from fewer number of people. But since the uh, uh, economic and financial crisis of 2008, you can see we've seen a decline in the number of people supporting. I also think this parallels with higher turnover in the workplace because 95, 98 percent of our giving, individual giving still comes from the workplace. But this was an important graph. I don't know how much, how important, but was one that told us where the opportunity was. Another one, this told the number, of, this is the t number of times people who gave last year had given in their lifetime to United Way. So we had roughly about 57 seven to 60,000 individuals. For 6,000 of them, it was their first time gift to United Way, almost 10% of our donor base. But you can see that a few people gave 25 years or 23 years in a row, that small group at the end. So we've got a reasonable group of loyal donors. How are we treating them was one of the questions we posed. Are we really treating them as if we really care about the fact that they are loyal? Most organizations, you know, I don't know if you remember the old American Express ads, but on your American Express card, if you have one, it says member since. Well, how do we get that attitude with our donors so that they want to stay connected? Connected. They want to make a gift again because they want to stay and have that member sense or donor sense uh, approach. This one takes a little bit of time to look through, but I guess if you go to the bottom, you see we had 77,000 people who gave um, in either 2017 or 2016 fiscal years. But as you can see, only 57, 58,000 uh, 58, gave uh, last year, two years ago, which meant we lost 20,000 people who could have given two years in a row. And again, the reason was we were asking them once and not following up. We don't do that anymore. One strategic change was literally to ask people after the workplace campaign was over, we're afraid we missed you. We, there's still six months left in our campaign at United Way, even though your workplace campaign might be over, won't you continue to support what, uh, the priorities of this community? And we're seeing some good results. In fact, we tested this, and I'll tell you, you don't have to change your organi whole organization. Test, A-B test, try something on a modest scale. This really wasn't a modest scale. In December of 2016, we decided to write a letter, and it was a very good letter, and I say that because some of the workplace campaigns had not finished yet. So we were asking people, will you please make a gift, understanding maybe you have pledged, but we just haven't found out yet. So we wanted to craft it so we weren't insulting anyone and we weren't double asking. And we wrote to people who did not give in 2015, but had given in previous years, and you can see the amount they gave. Now the bad news is we sent this out to 10,000 people. 
the good news is that only the 300 to 400 who responded gave us $422,000. Cost us $20,000 to, to, to mail this, and it was a pretty good return on investment, especially when you compare what these same individuals had given in the 2013, 2014. We're expanding that. We're actually testing six or seven letters in the next month to the same constituency, people who had given two years ago, but not last year. Um, it's an insult to your donors if you're not asking them because they're not reply doesn't mean they don't want to support you. It means they just haven't replied. And finally, on data, we looked at the contents and made a decision to seek this information out so we could stay in touch. Turned out that people who expressed an interest on a pledge card, I care about education, they tended to give twice as much money and were more loyal, two and a half times more loyal to United Way simply by checking the box that they cared about education or fiscal uh, financial stability or health, and then checked a box that they wanted to make a gift to United Way, even if that gift was unrestricted, because they made a connection between United Way, not just as an organization, but one that was helping education or basic needs or something they cared about. And the tactics are very, very simple, based again on the data. Retention of past donors, go out of your way to hold on to these people. Recapture the lapsed donors, and if you do a good job of that, you'll be out of business on that, that, uh, that square because everyone will be giving year after year. And finally, instill loyalty in your new donors. We want to send out a welcome packet in the same way that you, know, you hear from other organizations. Case does a really good job in their annual fund. Um, letting people know when they've made their first gift that their gift is appreciated. So donor data, donor behavior, and common sense led to the following areas. The workplace campaign, we wanted to really understand and see if we could renovate, renovate and redesign it. It still brings in over $30 million to us. We didn't want to you know, throw a baby out with the bathwater. Um, really understand employee giving as a subset of that uh, as carefully as we could. Individual giving, we're in front of 300,000 people in this community through the workplace campaign. That leaves us only a million people we've ignored who aren't working in a workplace campaign environment. And finally, principal gifts. We believe that people who will make major investments to United Way to solve problems in the same way they do make philanthropic investments to CASE, to the museums, and to cultural organizations. I'm going to go through these quickly, and but I'll just give you a sense that we've described the environment, larger companies with fewer staff. I mean, KeyBank is our largest uh, donor to United Way. And as they advance in technology, they're getting by with fewer people. Computers don't support United Way. It's the people that do. So while they're still critical to our success, they're not going to be where our growth comes from. It's going to be from smaller businesses, and we have to find a way, or from individuals, we have to find a way to reach them. The issues, you know, making sure that we're not putting pressure on donors, um, payroll limitations. Well, I asked informally, and this is, you don't need a formal study to find out what the right direction is, and I'll ask this group, you know, if you have a choice between payroll deduction, which, you know, takes $50 out of each of your paychecks, or maybe $50 a month coming out of uh, your credit card where you're earning points to see your grandchildren or your boyfriend in California, which is more attractive to you? Now, I'm taking a chance here, but the people I've talked to said, well, there's no tax benefit either way, or difference in tax benefit, why wouldn't I earn miles? And if we get a credit card, then when they leave the company, we're not losing them as a donor as well. These are simple questions, but very profound to the impact that we might um, have on our results. So how do we re replace the, uh, the workplace campaign? And we've got a really good story on that one. Um, it's First Energy. Um, John Scorey, the head of First Energy, really wanted to revitalize their campaign. It's a union and a non-union shop, so they were concerned that the union members weren't responding to the United Way campaign. It turns out that one of their employees was impacted directly by opiates. Um, they lost a son, an employee lost his son, um, and was, it was important. So John Scorey asked us what at United Way we were doing in that, in that arena, and we told him quite a bit, actually. We were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars allocating to agencies that were trying to make a difference. And he asked, could we couch the campaign around that? Could we educate their employees? So we did last year. And what we did is we made it about opiate addiction. And it was very personal. We also made it about education. Go beyond the headlines. Let the employees know when they're reading an article, what does that really mean? What medicines are in my chest I should be really concerned about? And then with service, instead of just asking them to write a check, 
they issue 670,000 monthly statements, and they've got crews all through three counties all day long, every day of the year. So could they leave something on people's doorstep, a uh, door hanger, telling them that there's a 211 helpline if they need help? If the following medicines are in your chest, you might want to be careful because they are addictive. And the employees felt engaged. They felt like they were giving something back in addition to the contributions they were making. And then they made the story personal because it turned out that while one person came forward to inspire this, by the end of the campaign, 10 others had come forward and thought they were the only ones being impacted by the opiate addiction. And it really made United Way personal. It made it about helping their fellow employees and not people they didn't know, but people they might care about in the community. <clears throat> and finally, we look carefully at data. And again, finding out lapsed donors to, to make sure that we're going back to people who have not yet made a gift. So we're all looking forward to implementing this strategy with all of our major corporations. Uh, UPS is a company we've talked to who really got interested in the 211 because they weren't aware of it, and yet it's almost an employee assistance program. It's a free service that can help anyone, whether they're kneeling with a personal situation, a family situation, a neighbor. And we actually refer people to almost 4,000 different agencies in 26 county, counties. And the HR folks, the human resources staff from, uh, from UPS thought this was almost like a free service, an employee assistance program for their folks. So we may try and couch this coming campaign in 2018, 2019 around that. Rollover. This is a great example of, you know, if I do one thing, this is the one thing. Get every company to let their employees continue to give at the level they're giving at. Don't make them sign up again each year. I mean, we, we do that sometimes when we sign up for benefits at our employer. There's a window in which we can make a change, but if we don't make a change, it just stays on. Cleveland Clinic is our largest campaign in terms of employee donations. There's no corporate gift. 54,000 employees now work at the clinic. They have rollover, which means if the employee doesn't make, take any action, whatever they signed up to give out of their payroll is continued in the following year. On August 30th, they announced their campaign. On August 31st, they were at 70% of last year's goal. Why? Because people didn't have to take any action. Every, almost every other campaign among 1,100 campaigns at United Way were at zero on day two. They had to start from scratch. So we're going to try and encourage all of our companies. One, there's less labor involved, less discussion with payroll, less work at their end, and we're going to get a much higher turnover, uh, much ho less, a lower turnover of, of donors. Open enrollment, because it's often payroll. If somebody starts in January, um, their campaign doesn't start till October, November. They don't start giving, in fact, until payroll deductions start in January. You lose a year of support from many of the donors. When an employee starts at a company, give them the option if they'd like to make a contribution. New donors, lapsed donors, retention, step ups, encouraging people who are at 900 to go to our $1,000 giving platform or giving category, the humanitarians. Um, and then giving societies. We have two distinct, we'll soon have three distinct giving societies. We have over 4,000 people who give $1,000 or more each year. It's really quite remarkable considering up to now the limited amount of cultivation and stewardship we've done. Why? Because at $50 per pay period, it's pretty easy for people to get to the $1,000 level. In fact, we have over 250, 270 people giving us $10,000 a year with, again, unrestricted to United Way. So this gives a, an idea. Lapse donors alone, 16,000 people. We left $5 million on the table by not getting these people. So what I'm sharing with you is where data and strategy come together. And actually, in some ways, it's very, very easy to identify where we need to go. The hard part is the implementation. I want to take a moment on principal gifts, because every organization will tell you the growth in fundraising today comes from your largest donors giving more and more money, paralleling the, dis, the inequity and wealth in this country, et cetera. Uh, uh, John Templeman, at, uh, who was the senior director of the annual fund here at Case, says they're raising more and more money each year from fewer and fewer people. So we have 566 prospects. These are people who in their lifetime have given over $100,000 to United Way, and actually in the last 24 years or 25 years, because that's all we've got computer records for. They've given to United Way $74 million. There's a service we engage that takes these names and by accumulating annual reports from other nonprofits tells where they've given to other organizations. These same 566 have given $1.3 billion to other organizations. We're getting one out of $18 
So there's an opportunity for us if we can make a case beyond a larger annual gift to go to these incredibly generous souls and ask them to support the work that we're doing. Well, without getting into the te technology, moves management is a theory of building how we build relationships over a lifetime with our donors, not just the annual gift. We have to employ that understanding and the kinds of initiatives that build solid relationships over a longer period of time. What is our case for support? Our case of support is impact initiatives. We feel that in addition to helping those in need today, we've got the talent in-house, we've got the power to convene to find solutions. Let me give you one simple example. Transportation is the most largest unmet need of the people calling in on 211. They can't get to their job interview, they can't get to work. 61,000 households do not have a car in Cuyahoga County. So imagine if you did not have a car, how you would get around to your doctor's appointments. Well, with the self-driving car, God forbid, bit everything that happened this week in uh, Tempe, Arizona, um, but also uh, uh, ride sharing, is there a new opportunity to not look at public transportation as the solution, but test the idea of giving people access to Uber and Lyft to get to their appointments? We need $100,000 for the next three years to research, to convene folks, to give us some test money where we might be able to actually make a difference and get people to their appointments. If we can get rid of that unmet need, we're gonna make a huge difference in the lives of people in this community. That is a major gift. That's a principal gift that we would be seeking from the community. We just haven't thought in those terms in the past. We felt if we wanted to find solutions, we were taking money away from those who needed help today. We're now looking at raising more money, not to take money away from those in need today, but to again, find solutions and to move the needle in hopes that the number of people in need will go down over time. I'm gonna pass that one. On the left is what we've been doing for 100 years. And yes, I think we have some programs and projects that are successful and some capacity building that we need, but it's this Impact Institute idea. Give us some money to test. Philanthropy in America is about risk taking. You know, we give gifts to hospitals and to educational institutions to try and find cures for diseases, knowing that we're not gonna be successful every time. Give us that same investment to let us try some ideas that may make a profound impact. Some will be successful, some won't, but that's what we're looking through, this principal gift support and philanthropic investment in what we're, at least for today, naming our Impact Institute. Bequests, United Way is about the annual fund helping people today. How much resources do you want to put to getting people to consider a gift that we may not realize for 10, 5, 10, 20 years? Well, you can see where the red line is. In literally one generation, the amount of money that's coming in through bequests is doubling. And while I might not get a pay raise for doing a good job on that now, someone will drink a toast in my honor if I put enough resources behind that today. I had the pleasure of working at Brandeis University, and the minute the university was done and opened its doors in 1948, Abe Sacker, the first president, went back to all those same donors and said, okay, put us in your will. When I arrived on campus in 1992, one third of our philanthropic dollars were coming in through bequests that had been established sometimes 10, 20, 30, 40 years earlier. Finally, retooling, technology and data. Um, CRM is constituent or customer relationship management. It's not just a database where we record a gift, but it's where we're keeping track of emails, conversations, interactions, news about our donors. Data we've talked about, and finally the platform, and that's gonna be the one that's gonna take the longest for us for a whole variety of reasons, but I'll touch on it. If you had heard me speak before <clears throat> about the science of giving and the end of the presentation is really how do we take technology to make it easier for people to give. Uh, this is how people give to United Way today. One third of our giving still comes in through paper pledge cards, one third through third party vendors that our companies contract with, and one third through a platform we provide called eWay, which is still a little bit cumbersome. But this is how most institutions today fundraise. This just shows where the donor mobile platform fills in, fits into our total, uh, excuse me, technological giving. 
So this is the quote, don't increase motivation, identify and eliminate obstacles standing in the way of the desired behavior. How great is it that we don't have to convince people to give? What we wanna do is make sure we're eliminating the barriers to allow them to do it. And I'm gonna ask you again, if you made a gift, to, if each of you decided at this moment to give a $25 gift to Mandel um, at Case Western Reserve, and how would you do it? If I told you about a really good book I wanted you to read, how many of you would know how to do that? You do it a lot faster and you do it while I'm continuing to talk. So our goal is to create a donor-centric platform to transact, record, and manage the charitable activities. The question is whether we allow that platform to our donors to give to wherever they want or just to United Way. And believe me, that's not an easy question to answer. Imagine giving all of our donors a platform where they could give anywhere, would they stop giving to us? And they would if we don't do a good job on the messaging. We have to make it worthwhile for them to give us so that they know, again, not the method, but the message compels them to continue their support for what we're doing. And on the data side, this statistic is still incredible. Nine out of 10 think that the process of making tax deductible donations should be easier. You hear about entrepreneurs trying to identify a problem and then finding a solution to it. This is a problem that's been here for many generations and it's been here for two decades of the internet era, still waiting for an, uh, an appropriate solution. How appropriate? Uh, take a guess, how much of giving, and I've led you on, so you're probably gonna guess what the answer is, or at least how much of giving, the number of transactions in a year are still given offline paper versus online versus mobile. And I won't keep the suspense, but the numbers are really depressing. 93% of giving is still done on paper in this country. I love to say it, shoe buying is well over 50% in this country online. And if you think about the decisions necessary, all the women are shaking, they're nodding their head because the men aren't buying online their shoes. Size, color, texture, you know, everything you can think of, but they make it so darn easy, you return it for free. Um, all we're doing is talking about moving money around, and yet we're hardly doing any of that on the most available technology available. So I, I share this with you not as a preach, uh, to preach about the industry, but to say United Way, if it's gonna turn things around, this is a really good way to do it. It also, I think technology can actually be a competitive advantage for us. Imagine your phone where you go on and simply click, type the logo of the organization. Your credit card address are already in there. It tells you what you last gave, when you last gave it. And then a short little video, in this case from the Cleveland International Film Festival, how appropriate, um, saying, you know, looking forward to having you join us in three weeks um, with a great season. So finishing up here, you know, these are ideas, going back to how we, I opened up, that I think we need to be thinking about. I wanna talk about them briefly. Um, we can't fundraise for United Way and grab everybody's attention year, long, year, year round. So why don't we have a United Way week? I haven't, I haven't confirmed this, but I believe when United Way was started, it was a week in Cleveland that everybody was encouraged to give. That didn't extend for three months in some companies and certainly didn't extend year round. The 24-hour big give, Columbus, I think, raises $20 million in 24 hours for all the charities that participate. Why wouldn't United Way help lead that cause, hopefully with the Cleveland Foundation and any of their local partners, not just to celebrate United Way, but all of our agencies. My alma mater, bless its heart, just finished, I think, a $7.8 million 24-hour give from 11,000 donors uh, this past Tuesday. Um, it grows every year, and again, it's that go back to what makes people happy is this sense of control that they have, a sense of community and connection, and certainly a sense of impact. We lost a lot of gifts from one company this year because right in the middle of their campaign, uh, we were hit with multiple hurricanes and natural disasters. Why don't we also allow donors to give on our platform to where they would like to support, even providing the ability to forward 100% of that gift? We capture a name, an interest, we look good in the community, and why shouldn't Cleveland help people in other communities as well? And finally, an idea I really want to work with, and you know, we ask people to give, but we know that young people today and all of us are happy to give when our friends ask us to give. You see it in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Velasana does a masterful job of getting people to get their friends to give. We tend to trust our friends. If they're giving, I'm gonna give. So let's get, have our friends get funds for us as well, be volunteers. And finally, let's take the allocations model that was created in 1913 here at United Way and take it 
gets to the retail level. Imagine giving to United Way and three times a year you were invited to vote on three or four projects on where you'd see some of the $100,000 be allocated. Now you're fully engaged in the process. You're also not only a donor, but you're also in a sense a foundation grant maker, connecting with your community and truly understanding the work that United Way is doing. So these are all the things that we're working on. Um, we're making some good progress. Uh, Maureen Horton from our principal giving staff joined me today just to make sure I didn't tell anything that wasn't true. Um, but we have a long way to go. I mean, it's hard both to change the board and their attitude, to change staff and employees who want to pull out of the hat what they've counted on in, in the past. Honestly, I think, you know, without, you know, um, without deflating both the uh, ego and the value of the staff that have been at United Way for a long time. It is a remarkable organization that if we simply show up, $30 million is gonna show up as well. There's a lot of work that goes on on the volunteer side, but we haven't had to change much to see that constant amount of money coming in. So in our boardroom, we've got these plaques, and they really show the evolution of United Way over 100 years. And um, it, I put up a, an extra plaque, actually just a piece of white paper that looked like it was wood. Um, I don't have a picture of it here, but basically it had a question mark on it. And it was basically asking ourselves, you know, ideas and innovation and advances in all of our organizations come from somewhere. The Big Mac did not come from the headquarters of McDonald's, nor did the idea of serving breakfast at McDonald's. It came from a franchisee. It came at the local level. And what I'd like United Way to do is for us to come up with the next idea, the new way that we should be approaching um, our you know, wonderful task of going to this community and asking them to support those in need. So just because I like being creative, I played with the idea that we wanted to create the new United Way, and then I realized actually, as you will now see, drum roll, the United Way really is in United Way all along. So thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer some questions. All right, we, we have a good chunk of time for some questions, and we have to use this microphone so that we can make sure it gets recorded, uh, even though it doesn't sound like it's amplifying. Um, and we have an, someone who is going to take care of that. I can take your questions. So just, if you want to raise your hand, we can get going with some questions. It seems like a lot of what you were saying was about simplifying things. So I'm recalling a conversation recently with a person I guess I better not name, who runs a comprehensive community center, and she was talking about her application to United Way, and she was saying there were like several streams of things you could apply for money, like what are you doing for education, what are you doing for the elderly, what are you doing for this, and her frustration in writing the application was she does all those things in an integrated way, and that's really the magic of what she does. All these problems are related. She's connecting that isolated senior citizen that we're all worried about, how's that guy doing, to kids in the local school, uh, which is making the elder less at risk, making the kids more motivated for school, better behave. That's the whole magic is the, she does everything. So I guess my question to you is, can we simplify United Way, can we use United Way to kind of educate people about all these social problems we're concerned about are connected? And it's a mistake to give the donor, you know, if you really care about this, we'll let you give just to that. That doesn't make any sense. So I just was curious what you would, if you It's would. not my department. Not your department, but. <laughs> no, no, I, it's, it's, I'm kidding. Um, it, it's a good question and it may be hard to believe, but we've actually simplified a lot in the two years that Augie Napoli has been there. I mean, I think we started out by saying we fund organizations and it's natural for us to want to put people into categories and organizations into categories. And this was in fact a simplified way of explaining what we were doing. But you're absolutely right. I mean, transportation's a good example. I mean, transportation might be basic needs, but it affects 
financial security and stability because you got to get to your job. It might affect your health, et cetera. The new allocations process is really about finding multiple ways to help people. So I, I think I would challenge that we are moving in that direction. I think the allocations process that we announced in, in January really is looking at you know, cross-fertilization of ideas, not only across these functional areas, but we're also looking much more favorably on organizations that are finding ways to collaborate with other institutions. So I, I guess my challenge is to you know, really dig in and spend time with our community impact folks, because you're absolutely right. And uh, you know, I can tell you right now that our whole approach, as I understand it coming out of community impacts, is to look for the cross-fertilization of ideas. You know, another example, and this is one that just drives me crazy, is leaded paint. I mean, Rochester's solved the problem. It's not science, it's advocacy and getting your laws to change that you can't turn over an apartment or a house unless you get it inspected. And if it fails, you gotta get it fixed. Until we get the law changed, we're not gonna see that. So it's not science, it's not about health, it's really about advocacy, which also is something we're doing more and more of. Gun Foundation makes a big deal of the fact that if they're going to spend $100,000 and invest in the community, they're going to have a much greater impact if they can get a law changed or get uh, our government officials to help find solutions. Hope that helps. Keep in the same row. Um, Prior to the current administration, there had been sort of a change in the culture at United Way that had caused a bit of alienation. Uh, how is United Way addressing that currently, and how are you getting the word out things are different? Well, you know, one of the great opportunities is um, to follow um, I was, you know, as a consultant, I always like to follow a bad consultant because I also thought I could do good. Um, United Way has had some ch challenges at the leadership level, I think at its approach and interaction with the community. Um, the way Augie's done it is several ways. One is he's been out in the community. You know, he, Augie has been part of this community for 30 plus years. He knows everybody, both on the donor side and the institutional side. So he's re-energized our council of agency executives. Um, we're, we're meeting regularly. Um, we're being good listeners. I mean, it's the best way to start, and we're, we're responding to people. Um, we did a needs assessment. I mean, we spent a whole year basically looking at what were the needs in the community and counted on all 140 agencies we'd had a historic partnership with. Um, and honestly, he worked on the inside. He brought in a leadership team. None of us have any United Way experience, but we're smart in what we do and what the experiences we've had, so we're approaching our work differently. But it's, it's just a matter, I think it's part of its communication, and part of its action, and then the you know, other's trust, and it's a two-way street. So, I mean, that's the approach that he's taken. And I think the other is marketing. I mean, he's done a really good job of being out there. I come across many people who say, I sense there's a lot changing in United Way. I read this article. We'd never been on social media before. We were actually trending nationwide last week based on a United Way chat because we've got um, Michelle Lenny is very, very competent and very good at getting our message out. So part of it's just getting the message out. Michelle will also tell you that she's got, you know, trolls on the internet. Every time we post something, there's a comment on there, you know, that, you know, as long as, you know, the CEO is getting 650,000 or a million dollars a year and taking his mistress to Italy on a private jet, I'm not gonna give to United Way. Well, that happened in the 1970s at the national level and the guy's dead now. But you know, and any time we respond to those, we get back fake news, so we have to ignore those. But I think United Way was its own worst enemy for a long time by not doing the things we talked about, by not treating our donors, donors with respect. Um, and the same applies to the agencies. They are full-fledged partners. You know, we are asking ourselves, you know, we, you saw the, 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 I think there's $4 billion coming into this community and for, um, human and social services, and we're raising 40 million. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is our role in this community? Is it to help the needy, or maybe is it to find solutions? And those kinds of questions are gonna scare the bejesus out of the agencies, because they've been counting on our support as part of their annual. So I hope that answered your question. And I hope it's based on the fact that most people in the room, and hopefully the people out there have seen a fairly dramatic change in the United Way in this community in the last year and a half, so, yes. Um, 
United Way is the best way to help the most people. I think we all kind of know that, but, um, and I'm a big supporter. But my question is, what is the advantage to the donor to give directly to United Way as opposed to the individual agencies or programs themselves? Well, I'd be out of a job, so, you know, and I'm a likable kind of guy, and I got two kids in college, so. No, um, you know, that's a, I get that question a lot, and I, here's my response is 85% of the money that comes to United Way goes back into the community, and that sounds like, you know, a reasonable amount of money, but what about that other 15%? Well, that 15%, in addition to just helping run an organization, does two things. One, it pays for a staff and community impact. These are the smartest people you'll ever see who understand what's happening in the community and ensures that that other 85% is being spent wisely. I don't have that confidence with every gift that I give out there, though I'd like to trust that you know, many of the organizations I support. So one is to ensure not only that the money spent wisely that we do collect, but that it's being spent in the most effective programs to help the most people. And the other, very honestly, is our 211 hotline. You know, essentially about one fourth of their budget comes from the gifts that we get. And as I said, we take a you know, quarter million calls a year, a thousand calls a day. And without it, the, you know, we're that first gateway to, for people to get the help they need. They're not going to get to the food bank. They're not going to get to a shelter. They're not going to get to transportation if they don't know where to go. And the calls we get, I mean, they're really remarkable. Inver invariably, somebody calls for one thing, and we help them with three others, because as you pointed out, they're all connected. But um, you know, that's my response. It's an organization that ensures that every philanthropic dollar is spent as wisely as possible. And we're an operating foundation. We're an operating organization through our 211. I'll follow up on that one a, a little bit. Um, it seems to me I have, as an individual donor, uh, as an engaged donor, uh, you mentioned kind of the connection that people want to feel and that one way to do that is to give directly to line agencies. And so if I look at well, one of the benefits of giving to United Way is I know I can have confidence that they've screened organizations and they've done the due diligence and these are, these are going to be well-spent dollars. But once I see that signal from United Way, I could choose to give additional direct dollars to that agency. So especially in the, as you discuss the technology, and if, if it gets easier to give to everybody, then, then it seems like that might funnel more dollars to... Um, individual agencies. So what's the question? The question is, um, I think the other, the other part for me, and you can tell me whether this, this rings true from the inside, is that by giving to United Way, I am buying into a community engaged process. It's not just about me making a decision about, I care about homeless families, so that's where my money's gonna give. It's buying into the belief that communities looking out for their members need a mechanism to organize that. So there is no other curator of community need aside from county government or city government, but not in this way that United Way is unique in. And if I, if I believe that, then I should be giving to United Way, regardless of the, what happened in, in the 70s. I should still also give to individual nonprofits that I care deeply about, but I, that I have to I have to buy into, at that macro level, that United Way is, is distinct in its role. You're asking and answering the question. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, I, hear, I hear that same question a lot. And oh, I, let me point it. If people are giving to United Way and it's the only human service agency they're supporting, that's 15% of their giving to the community. So they are giving. We acknowledge and we should celebrate that people are giving elsewhere in the community. So we just want to make sure that when they're giving to help human service, that it's being as effective as possible. I'd love people to give more, but I'd also like people to give to human service solutions as much as I'd like them to take care of the needy today. So 
But you know, I, I sat down with Augie a long time ago, and we've had this conversation about donor choice. You know, should we let our donors make a gift to any human service agency? Uh, you know, we're no longer Cleveland. You know, we got family. We've we've lived in different parts of the country. We would hope that if people move to Florida, they still support the United Way here because they feel a connection to community. Well, that's not how we're structured, and we if we want their gift to come here. We got to be willing to let you know our donors give that move into this community to give elsewhere as well. But if United Way was started today, I'm not sure we'd be focused on human services. That was the only thing we were fundraising for in the 1800s and early 1900s. There weren't animal rights groups. We weren't, wasn't aggressive campaigns for universities, for cultural organizations. The idea was collective philanthropy or collective charity in the community. If we were to start that today, I think there's a good chance the United Way would be sort of the annual fund of the Cleveland Foundation or the Community Foundation. We would allow people to support any cause. The, again, the, the efficiency was in fundraising is what we were talking about. The difference was Cleveland's model was bringing in the community to collectively give the money away. You know, it sounds like it's United Way deciding where the money goes, but it's not. We have experts, but they make recommendations based on what we hear back from the agencies. But then we have a volunteer committee, four volunteer committees, maybe they should all get together, and they do it from time to time, that make the final decisions. And they ask some very penetrating questions about the programs and projects that we've been asked to fund. So there's not a single person paid by United Way who makes a decision on these gifts. It is the community that's also making the gifts back, uh, the allocations. On that, just the follow-up. So on that directed, directed giving, the numbers I saw was something like 25% of the money that comes in, individuals are directing it to a specific agency. Yeah. Has, that, has that grown over time, and is that a risk to the overall you know, Mission. It's really interesting. The, the, the numbers at United Way here in Cleveland, uh, we have very loyal donors who support United Way in the concept. I think uh, you're about right. I think 75% of the gifts are unrestricted. I think another you know, 20% are either to human service agencies that we have a partnership with or to, you know, this describes the world we're in, we distribute gifts from people who live in Cleveland or are part of Cleveland campaigns, United Way campaigns, to 190 United Way agencies around the world. We, just, we write a check every year to the Aloha United Way because my guess is there's a Sherwin-Williams salesman out there who gives in the Sherwin-Williams campaign and allocates it for their local United Way. And that, to me, is exciting, is that we're providing, again, both a method and, I hope, a message that encourages people to support because otherwise we would lose those gifts, or better yet, Aloha United Way would get that gift. So. Yes, Gail. Is there a pushback on this automatic renewal that like you spoke of for the uh, Cleveland Clinic, where you said on the second day, 70%. Well, what if all of a sudden someone says, oops, I didn't read my mail, or I didn't read my email, or..." I didn't realize this was happening, and on the third day is really mad at their institution. Well, you know, we, we do count on the intelligence of our donors. We certainly want to make sure we're transparent. I think the idea is you give people to, uh, the option of opting out at any time. I love the idea. I mean, public radio out of Minnesota, I think 85% of their membership is renewal, and they do a really good job of holding on to donors because people don't take any action, and therefore they keep giving. The, the, the challenge for me is you have to have the make it really easy for people to change their mind. Uh, I know it's really easy for me to go to NPR's website and sign up for reoccurring or sustaining giving. I have no idea how to stop doing it. They don't make that number available. They, you know, they, don't, they don't make it too easy in the same way that magazine subscriptions are trying to do that too. You know, it's cheaper now to do a magazine subscription because it's only for six months, but it's automatically renewed and for the rest of your life. In fact, my wife who now handles our finances because she goes through every credit card bill and says, did you know you're on an automatic renewal for X, Y, and Z? And I go, I have no idea what that organization is. And even the ones that I do know. I, so yes, we, we have to be honest and transparent. But no, it's a convenience to the donor. I mean, again, remember, donors want to give. And to be honest with you, if I know I want to give $100 a year to an organization, 
Um, why wouldn't I want a, that convenience? The key is that I've got the control and it's not hard for me to change my mind. I mean, it goes both ways. I want people to increase their giving from time to time too. I don't know if it's the Cleveland Clinic, but another one of our campaigns will allow people to renew at 1% of their salary. So if they're getting an increase in their salary, in fact, their giving continues and it continues at a slightly larger amount, which is great as well. Now, you never want to trick your donors. You never want to fool anyone. And you just have to make, it goes back to that issue of control. You just have to make sure that donors have the ability to control the action that they're taking and you're asking them to take. But now I view recurring giving as a convenience and it's certainly powerful. And I don't hear any complaints out of the Cleveland Clinic that their employees, I think they love the fact that they're on a, they don't have to take an action to sign up, to do something they want to do. Yeah. I like that the slide you had on uh, the louder people give um, control, control community impact. And I'm wondering if there are generational challenges or generational uh, factors related to one over the other. Because I would suspect that younger generations are more concerned about the community and impact because it seems as though with, you know, a hurricane happens or, you know, farm aid or whatever, that there's this media blitz and everyone's get caught up in it. And so the, the question is really, are there generational challenges to giving? And then uh, the, the other issue related to that was the sustainability of having fewer and fewer donors give more, while that may be great, but over the long term, I suspect that's not sustainable. So I think those two things are kind of related, so yeah. about generational issues. Let me do the second question first. I mean, if in fact there are less people giving to charity and that number exists, it doesn't mean that on the micro level for United Way or for your agency or for a cause you care about, they can't make efforts to continue to see them grow the donor base. Um, it just takes a lot of effort. The other is just recapture your lost donors. You know, my alma mater has 60% uh, of the alumni have given at least once in their lifetime, less than 30% gave last year, which means 60%, you know, third, I think it's 100, I think it's 85,000 donors have said yes to the institution but didn't give last year. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure, because I think the older ones tend to be more loyal and sometimes have to, you know, they, 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 they care about the institution. They give because it's the institution. Answer your first question is absolutely a lot of differences. You'll hear a lot about millennials, so I don't know if there's a date that means you're, you know, one year you're one and one year you're not one. One thing they found out, they did a test where they took a message from a university, a fundraising message, and communicated that with a group of millennials. Then they took that same message and gave it to their classmates to communicate the message to the same to their friends they got a much better response with the identical message but it was coming from their friends and not from the institution younger people don't want to support institutions they want to support friends people they know and causes you know so I think when we we be careful about I always tell fundraisers and universities don't fundraise for nostalgia because you'll get a gift but if you fundraise to create the future you're gonna get people giving more money because that's exciting that's alive that's happening and I think for the young people they're taking jobs because they feel the company has an ethical mission that cares about it. They want every one of their purchases to have an ethical component to it. Um, you know, Bomba, if you've been following the sock company, I mean, they've gone from zero to a million in less than a few years. They found, they came across, a, we're, two guys came across a statistic that the one piece of clothing you can't get at a shelter are socks mm -hmm. because they're worn out, they're hygiene issues, et cetera. So they said, that's ridiculous. Can, socks are really important. I mean, that, as one can imagine just being at home and walking around in your socks. So their company was modeled after Tom's and they basically said for every pair of socks we sell, we're gonna donate one. And they've gone from zero to a million socks, I think in a year or two, and now they're on their way to 10 million and it's a really high quality sock, but more importantly, it's got a very noble mission which appeals to all of us in the room, but certainly to a younger generation. United Way's challenge is to a younger generation, one, they don't stay with a company very long, which of course is a problem with our method, and two is they don't care about United Way, they care about what we do. United Way is one of the most, respect, most, most respected and most recognized charitable brands in the country, but it's probably fairly low on the understood side, which I think even today many of you learned a little bit more about United Way. So. May I please ask what is the criteria 
for a philanthropic 60 years old to link with United Way as an agency. Say that again, please. What is the criteria for a philanthropic 60 plus years old to link with the United Way? Yes. Well, ultimately it's about the individual's philanthropic interests and what they care about and whether the institution helps them do that. I mean, I don't, you know, I think there are multiple organizations and institutions that can do that for you. But, um, you know, one of the things in, in principal gifts is, is not just, you don't go to, you know, there's a joke, you know, somebody said, you know, to a fundraiser, why are you here? And he said, well, you know, I, I heard you're really rich and I heard you're really generous. <laughs> you know, it, that, that's not enough. The other part that's missing is you have an interest in what we're doing, and it's entirely possible that you don't. When we look at identifying our top prospects, and I think this applies to the average, you know, anybody, um, we look for three things. You know, they, they have to have money that they want to give away. They have to have a charitable nature because you're not going to get money if they don't. And two, they have to have an interest or potential interest in what you're doing. I can't tell you the number of people. We made a really strong effort this year at showcasing two on one, walking people through the organization. I don't mind telling this story, and I don't think he'll be embarrassed by it, but um, uh, Chris Kelly is a managing partner at Jones Day, and he's co-chair of our campaign this year. And we've had three meetings of the campaign cabinet at local agencies. And, uh, and at the first one, we start with a tour so they get to go through it. And I don't know if it's his delivery, if he was really moved by it, but he said, you know, I've been giving to United Way for 30 years. And I never really understood till I walked through this organization how important my giving was to that. So here was a person who I think is a classic example of a you know, senior partner with a law firm who's been writing a $10,000 check for years and years who for the first time really understood what his giving was for. And that's an obligation I think every nonprofit has if they want to survive and also I think it's a duty they have to their donors. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Our, our hope is always to match the philanthropic interests of our donors and their intent with what it is that we do. And for some, it's not there. For some, we had a long conversation, actually Maureen did, I believe, with a donor who cared about children and was actually misinformed about how much we support and sponsor not only children in the community, but a specific organization he cared about. So it was our duty to you know, let him know what it is, what we were doing, and educate him. Got to let people go here. This and on, follow up yeah. on that. Individuals who want to get involved with United Way as a volunteer can just reach out to to United as far as serving on committees and sure. um, volunteering yeah. for that work. We've got a group also called our uh, Young Leaders. It's an affinity group of people, I guess, less than the age of forty, maybe thirty-five or whatever. I can sneak into, but um, they get together. <laughs> they have events. They like to work on. Bless you. Yeah, that's being heard around the world. So the, um, you know, it goes back to what I was saying. They feel connected. They build um, libraries in public schools and that they've grabbed onto that project because they can actually hold on to that. They can touch it. And it's really meaningful for their giving not to just go into a pot that someone else gives away, even though their, a lot of their giving just goes into a pot that we give away. But they see by their volunteer activities um, the impact we're having on the community. We have our allocations committee, which represent people who are just interested in participating. Uh, they attend several meetings a year, and we're looking at reinvigorating our engagement center, our volunteer center, to really look at both small, fam from families to companies, large and small, who want to work on a collective project together and help uh, link them up with a meaningful volunteer activity. And also, we just have people who volunteer within their companies to coordinate the fundraising in that, um, in their firm. And the reward there is we often spend time with them. They get to visit agencies and learn more about it. Eaton Corporation this year changed their model. The new CEO, Craig Arnold, wanted really to focus on participation, not on dollars. So he had in the lobby of the Eaton headquarters, which is a magnificent space, four different um, events, agency, essentially agency fairs during the course of the year. And the employees could just stop down, learn about what was happening at the agencies, all agencies that historically have been supported by United Way. And there are many volunteers at Eaton who help us run the campaign pain a result of that. Cleveland Clinic is a success story this year. I don't, 
still can't believe it, but they went up in donors, 40% participation, 40% more donors this year than last year, 20% more money. And part of it was new volunteer leadership, but also a lot more volunteers at the local level. So those are ways beyond, um, I mean, beyond fundraising, you can be engaged in, in ways that help us in, in the allocations, et cetera. So. Um, I have a question regarding um, the local United Ways that are under the United Way of Greater Cleveland umbrella. Um, how do you partner and how do you work together? Who is all involved? And how does that work in, in terms of donors? Well, there are two that are you know, legally part of us, uh, Medina County and uh, Geauga. Um, they have their own 501c3s, but we operate as one entity. Um, they still want to maintain their identity, and that's important. Um, many others, um, you know, we've got a cordial relationship with, but in a few we've had a historically antagonistic relationship with. Um, yeah, here's the challenge, and, and you bring up a really interesting question. You know, that's next year's talk about United Way is we really should be looking at consolidating the back office for efficiency stand, uh, from an efficiency standpoint, you know, whether we're processing gifts or et cetera. Um, there are almost, I think, 13, 1,200, 1,300 United Ways around the country. Most of them are tiny. And uh, it just doesn't make sense from an operational standpoint. And you think about the community here, most of us live in one county and work in another. I won't say most, but I think a large chunk of that group. Well, that gets into a whole nother confusion. If I'm giving at the workplace in downtown Cleveland at Key Bank, but I live in Geauga County, um, if I'm being solicited there, can I designate my dollars to go to help Geauga County, et cetera. Obviously, we want the donors to have that ability and uh, certainly want them to have the comfort level that we're not fighting each other, or we're not struggling, or we're not asking twice. So I think you're going to see a sea change not as fast as I think we'd like to see it. But certainly, it's been a discussion already as to how do we, um, how do we work more closely. And United Way Worldwide was in last week, and they talked about the fact that um, we may be spending you know, $50 million a year in back office that we could save if we could figure out a more efficient way of doing it. Some national organizations have local chapters, but all the gifts go through one, one office. Um, there's just an efficiency with that. So I won't embarrass the last person standing here, we, or sitting here, we should probably close up pretty <laughs> soon. <laughs> there's probably one person, you know, an ex-girlfriend of mine still on the air, so. So. Uh, well, I, I want to thank Dan again for a fantastic uh, walk through where United Way has been, where they are, and where they're headed on this uh, philanthropic fundraising mission uh, that we have continued to buy into. And I know if my dean was here, he would say, you should renew and up your donation to United Way right after you renew or increase your donation to the Mandel School. <laughs> So thank you all very much. Come next uh, month, April 19th, same place. Join us next month. Thank you again.